Hey everybody, it's Gio from Microsoft at Florida International University, and I've been away from you guys for a while, so I'm sorry for that. But on the other hand, I'm here to teach you something pretty cool today if you don't already know it, and I'm here to help. Now, if you haven't seen the Hour of Code video where I basically go on a coding spree and make a turn-based RPG, I recommend checking it out now. If you have, however, I have a treat for you. Today, I'm going to show you how to build exactly what I built in that hackathon, more or less. Um, so, we're going to start off by running the layout, and if you don't know what the game does, I'm going to show you, right? So, I've run the layout, and it takes me to a world state, and this says, choose a world. Right now, I only have the option of world 1, because I haven't beaten world 1. So, let me click world 1, and it takes me to a world with 5 raccoon enemies. And the number by the door is 5, which means I have to beat 5 more raccoons before I can leave this world. So I'm going to go to this raccoon, and now I've entered the fight mode. I have 100 life, he has 25 life. I'm going to use kick, and I used kick on my opponent, he hit me back. So that's how much I got attacked for. And I'm going to use kick again, and I used kick on him, he hit me back. So I'm going to use kick a third time, and hopefully it kills him, because if it doesn't, I may just die. And I won. So now that I beat the raccoon, he disappeared. My number is now 4, and I can continue to go through this world. So I'm going to go fight another raccoon, and I'm going to use Chuck Norris because I'm going to try to get through this as quickly as possible. And usually, the Chuck Norris just kills them really fast. And the reason I do that is because I added a Chuck Norris so I could test this and get through the world quickly. Because I don't want to go through the whole Final Fantasy fight ordeal. It's just going to be too much for me as a game developer. Anyways, uh, now the number is 0, so I can exit the world. And I did just that. It says choose a world, world 2. I don't have a world 2, but the logic works, and that's all that matters. So, now we're back at the construct layout. And I have three world options right now. I can always add more in later if I want to. It's going to be as simple as creating another world, and then just changing the name to world 4, and changing the color of the text. Simple. Uh, so, let me show you what's going on. The world state code says, here's my global variable which keeps track of what world I'm at. And then, uh, when I touch a world text, if it's visible, I'm going to go to that layout. And what I mean by that is that this is world 1, and I have a layout called world 1. So, what's actually interesting about what I'm doing is that it means I only have to write one method, and I can go to any world. Now, the downside of this is also that I have to name these layouts exactly as these text objects. If I misspell world one then it will not load it won't go to the layout at all um and that's that's the downside but it's also the upside so as you notice this is one event and i can go to whatever world i want so i think it's pretty efficient now there's a second event here and this one makes sure that the world text isn't equal to um choose a world and then it also checks that um the world count isn't equivalent so Pretty much what happens is all of these worlds have an instance variable, right? And this one doesn't matter because it's, it's my choose a world text. But each world that I need to, you know, worry about has a number corresponding to it. So world one is, has the value of world one and world two has the value of two for, wow, I didn't even spell world right. I just realized that. So I'm going to edit that. That's kind of embarrassing. Wow. Whoa, I... Oh my gosh. Wow, world is just one of those words. It doesn't look normal. I just didn't even realize that. Sorry, sorry to get off topic. But anyways, um, you understand what's happening. And then if these conditions are true, this gets set to invisible. And if not, then I set the text that doesn't match these conditions to visible. So what generally happens is choose a world is always visible, and then based on what world I'm at, one of these will be visible. And that's the world code and the world state code. I'm going to move to the world one code now to show you what I'm doing in my specific world. Right? So UID equals zero, enemy kills equals zero. The UID corresponds to which specific enemy I'm fighting. That's why I added that global. Enemies killed is a number that tells me when I can leave this world. So, my first event just checks every tick, 
and it says if the end kills are less than the enemies killed. Well, well it says end kills minus enemies killed, and that basically end has a variable called end kills, right? And depending on what world I'm at, I'm going to set that to a different number. So let's say I'm at world 2, I may set it to 10, which means I'll need 10 enemies on the screen. If I'm at world 1, I'm setting it to 5 because I have 5 enemies on the screen. And let me show you right now. See? So uh, I just set that to the value. And what that does is this number under the door will always be accurate. Now, the next event checks if I hit an enemy. So if I've collided with an enemy, we're going to set that enemy's UID to my global variable. And then we're going to save the game. And we're going to go to my fight. Right? So let's go to my fight real quick. And here is the fight. This is what it looks like. Three attacks. Here's the life. Right? And here's the event sheet for that fight. So I check every tick. And I set the life of the raccoon and the player to their instance variable values. So the player has life. The raccoon has life and they're both instance variables. So now I check if it's the player's turn, and there's a few events nested inside of this, but don't get intimidated, I'll explain it to you, and it's pretty simple. So my check is, is it the player's turn? If it's not, and the raccoon has a life greater than zero, then set his text to invisible, well set um, the attack text to invisible. And the attack text is pretty much all of these. Right? So that's where the nest comes in. I say if it's my turn and I've clicked this, and when I say this I mean the attack text, which is punch kick or chuck norse, then do the specific logic. So I check if the text is equal to punch. If it is, that means I've clicked the punch button and I set the value. If it's equal to kick, then I do the respective code for that. And if it's equal to chuck norse, I do the respective code for that. So the only specific things about these is that they all have different attack values. And the way I do that is that I set their instance variable to a random value between two, a few numbers. So for the punch, it's 1 and 10. For the kick, it's 15, 5 and 15. And for Chuck Norris, it's 15 and 25. And this is so that my attack doesn't always do the same damage. Now, after all that happens, I set the player turn to false, which brings me to this next event. Is player turn? No. Else. And then it goes back and forth. So let me open up the else and show you what's happening here. Right? It does a trigger once. And the trigger once is something I do when I do not want something to happen more than one time. Um, now, wait one second. And then I set the raccoon's attack. I make the raccoon attack by subtracting it from the player's life. And then I put that in the text that the raccoon has attacked the player. And then I set the turn back to false. So that is the enemy AI. That one line of, well, that one event is enemy AI. That's it. Uh, now, whoops. Now my next event checks if my raccoon's life is less than zero. Well, less than or equal to zero, which means I've killed the raccoon, right? So if I've killed the raccoon, load my game save that I just uh, saved in the world, in the world one code. Now, if the raccoon has killed me, which means that my life is less than or equal to zero, it's going to say you were defeated. It's going to wait 1.5 seconds, and then it's going to restart your layout. Because the way my game is designed, you have to fight the raccoon until you beat him. So now let's go back to world one, right? We've attacked the enemy. We leave the world, go to the other fight. And then when the load happens, we come back. So that pretty much happens here. On load complete, right? I add one to my enemies killed, which means I've killed a raccoon, and then I check, I pick the raccoon that I set the, the UID to before I left, which just means I'm getting the raccoon that I fought, and I'm destroying him. So that, that's a simplified version of what I just said. And here's the last part. So when I hit the door, if the text is zero, then add one to my world count, and send me back to the world state. So that's why when you guys saw me fight, and then once I left that world, World 2 was visible and World 1 wasn't, because I've now ascended to the next level. And that's it. So in 22 events, I ideally made a turn-based RPG. And it can get more efficient than that. And I'm going to show you. 
Anyways, have a great day, and I hope this uh, video slash tutorial helped. Thank you.